checking that. Okay. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. So great to get going. And um, I'm glad you can see my slides here. So Michael and I have been briefly introduced. Um, I'm based at the MRC. And I hope I've met some of you before, but otherwise it's nice to, to be together. Um, and we've been very lucky to be involved in a number of rapid reviews nationally um, and also regionally and, and globally. And I'm just going to mention a little bit about some, some views. I thought as a methodologist, which is kind of um, something I would call myself, um, I thought I have to touch a bit on the methods. And I know you've covered a lot of this, but I just want to give you some thoughts around, um, you know, the around the development and process and thinking around rapid reviews. So just to start off with, I think it's useful, Michael and I've included our um, disclosures and acknowledgements. And as B said, we're both members of the South African Grade Network. I co-lead that with Taryn Young at the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare. Um, and I'm also very fortunate to work with Trudy, who you'll hear from later, as a member of the Essential Medicine List Committee, um, particularly working on COVID and more broadly on other essential medicines. And it's nice to see you, but in case you don't know, I know and do your, your, your videos on. Okay, <laughs> cool. All right. So with that aside, maybe you've seen and heard this before, but rapid reviews have got many, many names. <laughs> And, um, and this is a, what do you call it, a word cloud from Andrea Trico's work around different words for rapid reviews, sometimes meaning the same thing. And, and perhaps you've covered this, but I, I think it's pretty essential that whatever review you're doing, that your purpose of it and the objective is clearly, clearly, clearly defined. Um, and something else I wanted to mention is just because you know, when we talk about the difference between systematic reviews, rapid reviews, scoping reviews, just because it doesn't have systematic in the, in the name of it doesn't mean it's not systematic. All of these are done systematically. But let's um, just move forward with how rapid reviews um, started to come into work um, in um, COVID work that we were doing. And, and B, can you let me know, have you seen this slide before just comparing the different kinds of reviews with rapid reviews yeah we did that in the first session but um it would be good for you to okay. just touch briefly on it okay good did you have Chantal here or someone from Cochrane Austria no it was me <laughs> uh, okay yeah I did right. that session okay all right so <laughs> um then I guess you would have seen that there are lots of different kinds of reviews and that we're focusing on the rapid review type um, and that it's still very important to be explicit about what your rapid review process and protocol is. And we, um, together with the Department of Health, when, when COVID hit, um, we had the job of putting in place a protocol to ensure that we were systematically doing the work. Um, I'll come back to that. So perhaps then you've also covered that there's uh, Cochrane's Rapid Review Methods Group, and they, they interestingly have been doing work on rapid review methods and how best to do it from, for several years. And it just so happened that their methods guide and their protocol for rapid reviews, which can be adapted by anyone, came into play kind of early in 2020, just before COVID. Um, so that was particularly handy because when COVID came and I realized that this was a particularly urgent situation where rapid reviews need to come into play, um, I found their methods guide and was able to use it to adapt it for the needs of the National Department of Health process. Um, the Cochrane rapid review takes between one week and six months, depending on where you cut corners. And I think Michael will talk a little bit about that shortly. But is it within the defining the question and making it a very narrow scope? Um, the good thing is that the protocol can be flexible and that you can adapt it for multiple different systematic review type PICOs and questions. Your search, you don't want to search too broadly because you'll be screening forever. Do you want to limit the language, limit to not include supplemental or gray literature? 
all of these things will limit the generalizability and the, the ability of a rapid review to reflect the full data set. So there are, there are um, trade-offs with these um, shortcuts. Um, so the rapid reviews, I think have been a, a great experience working with Trudy and the other colleagues at the Nas National Essential Medicine List, um, where, where many of you might know about the EML and the STGs, the standard treatment guidelines that have been running since 94. And they are underpinned by the whole principle of equity and access and making sure that every, that there's one national guideline that can inform treatment and care throughout the country in all provinces. But as much as um, the kind of the, the underlying principles have not changed, processes in guideline development have, have evolved quite substantially in the past 20 years, 30 years. Um, and so how we do reviews to inform these guidelines is, has changed. So what happened in March last year, and do I have, yeah, in March last year, I think we had the first question came through, which was about the use of interferons for treating COVID. Now, many of you may not know about interferons. I don't know terribly much about them. All I know is that at that point, uh, one of the, uh, another government was donating stocks to South Africa and South Africa National Department of Health had the question, should we use it or shouldn't we? And so that was a particularly rapid over the weekend review. That was the first review that, that um, we did for addressing COVID requirements. And then quite quickly, I realized we would, and we all realized that we would need a reporting guide, like a methods protocol, and that we would need a reporting template. And working together with Trudy and others, we were able to um, develop those and those are now all available on the website here. I'm not sure if anyone has been on the website. Um, you can let me know in the chat or, um, or by raising your hand. But um, have you guys come across the WHO, uh, not the WHO, the South African government rapid reviews yet? Yeah. Are people able to respond? Yes, um, they okay. are responding in the chat. So now I can see that. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm so glad that I'm then bringing it to you because I think whether you're in healthcare or working in any other field, um, all of us want to know, you know, should we use vitamin C? Should we use ivermectin? Does, do antibiotics work like azithromycin? I've just got a few up here, chloroquine. So there's an incredible wealth of work that happens. We conduct these as rapid reviews, but we do them incredibly systematically. On the website, you'll see our protocol for the rapid reviews and also the terms of reference and the methods guide that Trudy has drafted and she'll tell you about. But highly recommend you to visit the site and get the real, the real truth on what works and what doesn't for COVID. This is how the um, reviews are looking at the moment. Um, trying to capture key findings, the main recommendation, which then informs, further informs the guidelines, the national COVID guidelines. Um, but underpinning this is a full review um, that you can have a look at to see what the process is. It's a defined question and a PICO, as we say up front. Um, there's a systematic search of electronic databases, screening of that, and then extracting the data. Um, so I think at that point, I'm going to hand over um, to Michael, <laughs> over to you. Thanks, Tamara. Um, and just to say that um, this is just myself and Tamara's notes that we put together around some of the experiences we wanted to share with you around conducting rapid reviews that we've had. Um, and it's just a way of introducing some of the um, challenges and or notes that we have and i think one of the most important points that we can make is to say that rapid reviews play an important role in the face of emerging health crises and if you're thinking about doing a rapid review yourself or using some of the methods in a rapid review to doing your own review i think it's important to note that 
the rapid review process is really there for questions posed by policymakers where there is an urgent need for the best um, available evidence uh, to inform that kind of healthcare decision. And um, cutting corners uh, or taking some shortcuts in the methods is in fact uh, really not advised unless you are doing a particular um, rapid review for an urgent and emerging health crisis question that needs urgent answers. Um, and again, the real, the, 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 the overarching principle of a rapid review is to try and balance uh, rigor with speed and speed by trying to cut some, uh, some corners that we can uh, to try and speed up the process. And some of the questions that we have and, and I think are still emerging in the evidence synthesis community is around, well, we've done these, these rapid reviews, for example, for national and other settings, uh, but this is really just a temporary measure um, and it's by no means, um, I think, there to, to stay as the status quo for how we do reviews at all. Um, and so when do we transition to doing full reviews? When do we take these rapid reviews and uh, repurpose them into full systematic reviews? At which point do they become living reviews if we're going to update them continuously? And so these are some of the questions that we have um, that I think we're still trying to get answers for. And again, um, when it comes to doing a rapid review or thinking about rapid reviews, the first step, and I guess the first step in any kind of evidence synthesis journey that you might be taking is to be very clear about what kind of, what the purpose is firstly of your evidence synthesis. Um, and that could be, you know, our purpose is simply just to see what's out there. And in that case, you don't need to do a rapid review or a systematic review. You can just go to a scoping review or you specifically want to find in, uh, the information about um, a, the prognosis, a prognosis question. So you might move on to a different kind of review type or about screening. So you might look at a dieting and diagnostic test accuracy review. And, but the key principle is make sure that you are, that the review that you're doing is really fit for purpose. Um, and it speaks to your time, your human capital and the resources that you've got. And so on the next slide, um, really the rapid reviews is around a stopgap to try and find the best sale of evidence in the context of emergencies and urgent responses. Um, and in that, what we found is really useful to do from the a priori together with your team is to match the question with the appropriate review type and, and to have a focused question. So tomorrow's previous slide, spoke about defining the question in bold. And it's so important where we want to limit some of the comparisons or interventions that we might be putting forward, limit the number of outcomes to critically important outcomes. But the type of question would inform the type of review that you're doing. So typically, if you're looking at rapid reviews, we'll typically look at kind of intervention type reviews, so prevention or treatment, or screening kind of diagnostic test accuracy reviews. Um, so, this is key because it also influences everything else that happens downstream. It influences study design, your eligibility criteria, and all of those things. Um, so if you don't need to cut corners, if you, if you think of doing a review yourself um, and it's not urgent, it's not for, an, for, for a health crisis or a question, then my advice would be not to cut any corners and to try and be as rigorous as possible within your means. Um, and some of our reflections of our own experiences with working with reviews, working with rapid reviews, is really to know your limits and to know, um, to know, to ask yourself, do I have the resources, the human capital and the expertise to be able to dedicate to doing a rapid review? And if not, then, then I, would, um, I would think of, of another approach. Um, and again, be familiar with the resources that are out there. If you are doing a, a rapid review, um, it's no point in reinventing the wheel and duplicating efforts. So draw on what others have done. There are an amazing evidence repositories out there that we as um, have drawn on, for example, COVID NMA and others. And as we all know, uh, you might produce an e evidence report, um, but it might just stay there. We need to be active uh, not just about producing evidence, but also following things, following through 
in translating that evidence into policy and practice. So either through a guideline mechanism or through being responsible with regards to knowledge translation. And lastly, on the last slide that I just quickly want to just as an overview give to you is around some key resources that I think would be very useful for anyone, uh, whether they're doing COVID related reviews or scoping reviews or systematic reviews to have a look at. Um, and whether it's COVID or not, um, I think these two resources produced by COVID End on their website, uh, you can go to covidend.com. It's really it's an international group of uh, more than 50 evidence synthesis organizations that have come together and pooled resources and ideas around how we can support the evidence demand and the evidence supply uh, when it comes to fighting COVID. And on the left, you can see an algorithm that is there to support um, people who are interested in doing evidence synthesis. And really both of these figures speak to reducing duplication of effort um, and uh, being efficient with the resources that we've got and reducing research waste. So on the left, it's a, a bit of a decision tree around finding and using existing systematic reviews and asking the question of, can I use that to answer my question or should I move to starting a new review or consider updating an existing systematic review or whatever the, and resources behind that. And on the right, we have a decision tool around if you're looking at um, using guidelines or developing a guideline, what would be the process around going through that? And there's some useful resources as a PDF behind this that I think would be useful for all to look at. And um, B, that's it from my side. I see our time is almost up. So I'll say a very big thank you for myself and Tamara. And of course, we're looking forward to the rest of the presentations and the discussions. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, Tamara. That was a really good introduction into rapid reviews, um, a reminder from last week's session. Um, so for those of you who didn't attend, um, I hope that you did receive the recording link to that session. Um, it is available and um, you are welcome to get it from us if you haven't received it yet. Um, it will really just um, also build on to what Michael and Tamara have said. Um, so I'm going to um, hand over now to um, Trudy Leon from um, the National Department of Health, um, who will speak more um, about the experiences of the COVID-19 um, reviews and um, um, how they were conducted in, in terms of actually being able to, to influence um, clinical guidelines. Over to you, Trudy. Um, thank you very much. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me quite clearly. Sorry, I'm, I'm on a holiday and I'm sitting in the um, business center. So everybody can hear me fine. Is that okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. So, B, I just want to say thank you very much um, to the University of the Western Cape and um, to your colleagues for providing me an opportunity specifically to speak on the National Department of Health's work on the COVID-19 rapid reviews. Um, okay, where are these buttons? There we go. So I just needed to show you a quick uh, snapshot of um, where we are at the moment. We all know we're living in, living in unprecedented times. Um, though I, I'm unsure if it's now become the norm. Um, at the time that COVID reached our doorstep um, on the 5th of March, 2020, um, we all know that we didn't have any prevention or treatment protocols in place. So policymakers, and that includes us, a National Department of Health, we needed to work at an accelerated pace to support um, our population. Um, and good quality evidence was obviously needed to help um, for the management of COVID-19. So this is a snapshot of the current COVID-19 situation in South Africa. I'm proud to say that the vaccination rates are slowly climbing and um, our current positivity rate is in the region of five to 10%. So as Michael mentioned, um, the living maps, we had also an unprecedented experiences in terms of the research-based evidence. Um, the pandemic, as one um, author of the publication mentioned, stress tested the way the world produces evidence and also exposed the flaws, as I'll show you later in one of the examples. And we literally had research on full thrust. However, the, this accelerated pace oftentimes resulted in studies of very poor quality, 
with the retraction of publications because the data was unreliable from renowned or um, reliable um, um, journal, um, journals with high impact um, um, factors. And given the nature of the rapidly growing pandemic, most of the studies were actually observational. And that is, as we all know, subject to bias and confounding, um, or from RCTs with lots of limitations. Remember, the studies were, and the evidence was being generated at such a high pace. And there was the possibility of preliminary RCT results that were being published and were being reported, which were most in preprint format, that may be reversed as more data becomes available. So when data was negative, it could have been positive, or the other way around, um, positive initially, but as data evolved, it could have become, it would become negative. So this living map is an indication of how rapidly evidence evolves in this space. I access the same map, um, which is the Estim Monica's database on the 31st of March. And there were four, 20, 31st of March this year, there were 422 RCTs that were identified as reporting data. Look at this, this is yesterday, 4th of October, 2021. There were now 730 RCTs that have been identified. So just to give a bit of background, um, obviously we all know the COVID-19, um, South African COVID-19 response was to develop guidelines. And as Tamara has mentioned, um, these, um, these have been updated. And fortunately, um, the different modules are going to be updated and published uh, rather than wait for it as a whole to make sure that data is and guidance is available to the clinicians and the public out there. And the up, we're excited to say that the update of the therapeutics model is, module is imminent, and that will be in the new format um, that Tamara has shared with you. But obviously, in order to update the therapeutics model, module of the guideline, as my colleagues have already mentioned, you needed to appraise and critically review that enormous amount of information, publications, and evidence, um, and it had to be done critically. Fortunately, as Mara had mentioned, of which she's also a member of the NIMLAC, an infrastructure was already in place in the form of the ministerially appointed NIMLAC. We all know that um, the NIMLAC is, establishes, is established to develop and maintain the essential medicine list and standard treatment guidelines. So what National Department of Health did, they leveraged off the current existing EML process. Um, I need to reiterate, the essential medicine list satisfies the priority health care needs of the population. And it obviously specifically covering our quadru quadruple burden of disease. Well, this SDGs is merely almost like a protocol or an implementation mechanism of the essential medicine list. Note the typical review cycle is two to three years. This is how long it takes to get done. Um, anyway, and when COVID-19 entered on the 19th of March, NIMLAC um, recommended that a subcommittee be established to provide inputs on the medicines for COVID-19 and the EML, the review process, was adapted to a rapid virtual process, as what Tamara had mentioned. Recently, the NIMLAC subcommittee was appointed as a NIMLAC MAC on COVID-19 Therapeutics, which is now a direct advisory committee to the executive management of the National Department of Health. All the governance documents is placed on the website, as, um, as I shared in the chat box, um, and that includes their terms of reference, the generic um, protocol template that um, that Tamara had mentioned, as well as the reporting templates for the PICO and the RAPT review report. Note that these are all dynamic um, as, and is um, updated as the process matures and um, as the committee um, learns um, and improves the process going forward. So this is just a quick snapshot. Um, I'll, I'll going around showing really how the NIMLAC and the NIMLAC MAC on COVID-19 therapeutics are positioned. So very rapid evidence synthesis reports were born. And I just need to note three important key points. The concept of universal health um, healthcare access um, was very important, especially in the expanding global pandemic and shrinking global medicine supplies. Um, as um, Michael mentioned, um, the rigor of evidence synthesis is important to be maintained, even though it's a rapid, it is a rapid review without compromising too many, without compromising standards, even though we're taking um, a couple of shortcuts. And time is, was obviously an important consideration. You can see over there um, how long these rapid reviews took to take 
um, to, co uh, to conduct compared to a normal systematic review and a meta-analysis. So the rapid review process was now done in not two to three years, but within seven to 21 days, putting the committee and the reviewers under quite a bit of pressure. But I need to stress this was not done in isolation. There was a lot of support, as you can see on the top here. And, uh, and I just need to emphasize that the rapid review process was undertaken using as much a robust process as possible. And this is all described in the committee's terms of reference, which are published in the NDH website. So the first rapid review was published on the 31st of March, 2020, but they're very important key principles. And each one of these speaks to good governance. Um, the, I just want to bring your attention to point number eight, which was, which is um, the opportunity to appeal an IMLAC decision regarding an essential medicine for management for COVID-19. And um, this policy is also available on the NDOH website in the same folder that I shared um, on the link provided. Okay. So this merely is a um, overview of the protocol, um, which you can see follows a very systematic process. I just wanna bring your attention to three points here. The PICO, an a prior predefined question that needs to be ratified by the committee before the review is undertaken. The appraisal is done using internationally recognized standardized tools. And also important, the review team consists of methodologists as well as committee members who are actually most, most of the time clinicians that are on the front line. Okay, so as I indicated, there's continuous emergence of evidence in the COVID-19 space. So there's an expectation very much so in the early, early, early days for the committee to update a rapid review report every time there's new evidence, whether it was weak or strong evidence. So the committee then developed a framework to update reviews. And this is based essentially on the strength of the current recommendation of the current report as well as whether the new evidence is either strong or moderate or weak or very weak or very, very weak. This is a summary, a list of the sum, a summary of the recommendations. You can see on the left, most are negative, except for the use of corticosteroids in the middle amongst patients requiring oxygen supplement, supplementation. Again, as mentioned by Tamara and colleagues that the rapid reviews are available on the National Department of Health website. And the most current report is published on the website. Um, 23 medicines have been reviewed, 48 reviews have been completed, includes updates and summaries since March 2020, and currently there are five reviews in progress. So these asked me to provide some high, um, some a few examples of the rapid reviews that have been undertaken by the NIMLAC MAC. I'm just gonna give you, there's not much time, um, some highlights of a few reports. Um, but for detailed information, um, please refer to the detailed review reports, as well as the webinar series that is hosted by Cochrane SA and um, SAMRC, where the committee members are presenting on specific rapid reviews. The URL link is provided here at the bottom and to access upcoming reviews or sessions, um, but um, if previous recorded sessions are available on YouTube. So the first positive recommendation was for systemic corticosteroids, and this was done based on a meta-analysis of RCTs, which included the very large um, UK recovery RCT. The recommendation, strong, certainty of evidence was moderate. Okay, um, the, the, the subcommittee at that time, which is now the committee, um, made a recommendation, a strong recommendation for the use of short course, low dose corticosteroids in hospital, hospitalized severe COVID-19 patients requiring oxygen support, whether it was invasive or non-invasive and cautioned against the use of COVID-19 patients not on oxygen. This report is available on the website as mentioned. 
So the rationale provided was that a meta-analysis of eight RCTs showed a mortality benefit um, with the corticosteroids, especially amongst those on invasive ventilation, whilst one RCT amongst those not on oxygen showed no evidence of mortality benefit. And as you can see over here, and the possibility of harms. So this was a very straightforward rapid review to do because the evidence was really um, 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 of a certain, was very certain. However, the only challenge with this review was the continuous updating, updating of the review report with a constant emergence of new evidence during 2020. So three reports were ratified for publications. Um, was the initial report um, that was done before the 23rd June 2020 um, um, rapid review um, was actually abandoned three quarters of the way um, as only observational data could support that. So the evidence review for ivermectin was challenging, very challenging for the committee. Um, the evidence was very of very poor quality and very uncertain. So as we all know, the current position of the regulatory authorities worldwide recommends against ivermectin in the management of COVID-19. And by the way, this includes India, which I unfortunately have omitted from the slide, but it's good to know. So there's been a quite a bit of advocacy for inclusion of ivermectin in the national COVID-19 guidelines. We've got organizations such, such as Afri Forum, Ivermectin Interest Group, the Value Pharma Value Group, the South African Society of Integrative Medicine, as well as in individual clinicians such as a retired UCT professor and the public submitted motivations to the Minister of Health um, and the National De Department of Health, including legal notice of motions. So an evidence summary was first developed um, based on hardly any evidence, and then ev evidence reviews were then con conducted with updates as new evidence emerged. Obviously, the NIMLAC um, COVID-19 committee uh, suggested that ivermectin not be used in the management of COVID-19, except in the context of clinical trials, because of very low to low certainty evidence. There's just too much uncertainty regarding this, this agent, and hopefully um, new evidence, emergent evidence will provide more high quality evidence to make a more um, um, strong decision. So this was based, the, the latest updated report was based on the Cochrane review. As you can see, um, amongst the setting of moderate to severe COVID-19 um, patients, there is no benefit of mortality, as well as amongst mild patients. Very important. Um, the Cochrane review obviously didn't include Algazar and the Niar et al. studies. And the Algazar et al. Egyptian study was actually retracted as a preprint from publication because it was based on fraudulent data. Um, so this actually affected the Hill et al. meta-analysis and the Bryant et al. meta-analysis. All both of these, all these papers have been retracted from, from the public space. One last uh, medicine before I wrap up is the Remdesivir um, agent, um, which publications indicated that the medicine was cost effective um, in terms of saving ICU beds. But the quick question that the committee was faced with was whether this was generalizable to the South African setting. And after five updates <laughs> of the review report, um, the committee suggested that Remdesivir not be recommended for treatment of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So just looking at the COVID and um, the evidence decision framework that guided the, the decision, okay, the evidence was a systematic review of five RCTs, which included the large solidarity, solidarity trial. The evidence of benefit was, what was the evidence of benefit? There was no impact on mortality and no impact on uh, prevention of ventilation. Do the benefits outweigh the harms? Um, no increased risk risk of adverse events were reported. Then looking at other value judgments, feasibility, it was an unregistered medicine, but it had just recently been registered by SARPA in um, 20, um, July 2021. 
but there is limited supply globally, including the country where it was actually manufactured in India. Um, what was the values, preference, and acceptability? We've got no local survey data, but obviously all patients and healthcare workers want something that work, they want anything in their armamentarium. And regarding equity and human rights, there was a bit of uncertainty there, and it was dependent on access in the medicine via Section 21. And because of limited availability, we would have inequitable access across country. So those um, provinces that were very well run with um, adequate capital would be able to access it easier compared to other um, provinces, which was totally inequitable. Regarding resource use, the um, technology is expensive and you need to consider other um, additional resources such, such as laboratory monitoring um, that would be required. So the committee made this a, con a conditional recommendation and note that this is all agreed on by consensus. So this basically just explains exactly what I had just mentioned, just summarizing it. Um, looking at the clinical um, picture, um, Remdesa had no effect on mortality. Note that this um, outcome was um, statistically insignificant because of um, cross null value of one. Um, it had no effect on the need for ventilation, so it didn't improve the, um, um, the need to not use ventilation, and it had no effect on the length of hospital stay. Um, important to note is that while one study reported a significant reduction in time to recovery, it did not report duration of hospital stay. And the medicine is just recently been SARPA registered. So just to wrap up with um, that the rapid review process has been exciting, dynamic and exhausting, <laughs> but an exhilarating process. And the committee and um, NDOH have identified a number of challenges. The first thing is that very rapid evidence synthesis was needed. And these required constant updating. Um, as you recall, Remdesivir had five um, updates within such a short period of time. Evidence is mostly in preprint format, um, and new evidence is published whilst reviews are underway, i.e., the corticosteroid review. Um, the committee needs to ensure efficiency and accuracy um, by promoting sensible stewardship of the reviewer's time. Remember, these reviewers have got competing interests as well. Um, epidemiological pandemic data um, is, is generated in parallel as it happens to the review um, and is not yet obviously available in hard format, a hard copy format, but, um, and the committee many times needs to work on this data to do modeling um, such as cost modeling, et cetera. The cost of biologics is very high. Can the South African um, public sector um, afford it. It's not a matter of cost effectiveness only, but affordability. Affordability is key. Um, do, would we spend 100 million rand on a biologic that provides marginal mortality benefit, or would one channel, um, would the National Department of Health rather channel that into vaccination? So very tough choices to be made. Then you also have the legal and public pressure, as I indicated with the Vimectin. Um, we are under-resourced, as we always are, and the NDH Secretary, I myself, um, um, support this committee and these processes, um, later, as well as all the other EML work, and most important, as what the committee highlighted to the National Executive and the Minister of Health, was that we have underfunding of the rapid reproduction process, advocacy and implementation thereof. So even though we're working with partners, this may not be a sustainable model. And obviously more investment is required. I cannot um, not acknowledge um, all the partners and um, um, sponsors that have participated in this. Um, as a National Department of Health, we specifically would like to thank the NIMLA MAC on COVID-19 Therapeutics Committee. A lot of dedication, time and effort has gone into this. COVID NAMA team, which we draw on to provide globally accessible up to the date COVID 19 living reviews, the Great SA Network, Network, and other reviewers for supporting the rapid review repose process, Cochrane SA and SARMRC, Hero for supporting with economic evaluations, and the Better Health Program South Africa. Thank you very much. And that's it for me. Over. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Trudy. Um, I'm sure that we can all relate to the examples um, that you provided, very relevant, of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I, I see some comments in the chat. Please do keep um, comments and questions coming. We'll have um, enough time at the end um, to respond to these through a panel discussion. Um, so I'll hand over to Catherine Houghton um, from um, uh, the National University of Ireland, um, who will uh, briefly speak to us about experiences with conducting um, qualitative rapid reviews. And, and in fact, last week, I think there were a few questions around um, qualitative rapid reviews, because of course, those are the ones that um, are sometimes less, less seen in, in publications. So it's, it's really exciting to have Catherine here for that. Um, over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much. I've just realized I've locked my children out of the house, so I'm just going to run and open the door. I'm so, so sorry. I just saw them running around the garden trying to get in. So just bear with me two seconds. No problem. Are there any sort of um, urgent one or two comments that we can take now um, that you'd like to direct to Tamara, Trudy and Michael? So, oh, Catherine is back. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm sitting on the okay, desk. go ahead, Catherine. It's just one of those days. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I really enjoyed the other presentation. So, thank you for that. Um, I just check that you can see my slides now. Yes, we can. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Linda Beastie and Pauline Maskell as well, as they um, helped kind of develop some of these slides for various platforms. <clears throat> um, so as you said, they, um, I guess, you know, there's different nuances with the qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, and the purpose of today is really just to reflect along the, um, Sorry, I'm out of breath now. <laughs> Along the journey of the rapid QES, looking primarily at what the guidance was and the decisions that we made and some reflections on those. So I won't be focusing too much on the findings, but obviously people can contact me afterwards if they do have any questions about the findings themselves. Um, <clears throat> so back to March in 2020, um, I work as a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing and Midwifery in the National University of Ireland in Galway. And we're home to Evidence Synthesis Ireland, Cochrane Ireland, and the Trial Methodology Research Network. We collated our efforts at that time um, to uh, prioritize COVID-19 activities to support healthcare policy and practice. So there was a number of rapid reviews conducted at that stage. Um, and I led out on the rapid QES that was published in Cochrane shortly afterwards. So our question, again, as mentioned by Trudy, we had an a priori question, which was the barriers and facilitators to healthcare workers' adherence with infection prevention and control guidelines for respiratory um, infectious diseases. So this is one of the series of rapid reviews that Co Cochrane contributors prepared. This was the first qualitative evidence synthesis published in the Cochrane Library. And because we began um, in March, 2020, we couldn't really look to the COVID uh, primary studies, so we looked at other respiratory infectious diseases for the evidence, such as TB, SARS, MERS. And we overall we included 20 studies for our synthesis, and it took 25 days from registration to publication. So the review itself took just under two weeks, and then obviously with peer review and publication, um, it, it in total it was 25 days. And here you can see uh, the core team that were involved. Um, and as again, ha as has been emphasized by the previous speakers, um, a few of us on the core team had extensive experience of qualitative evidence synthesis. You can see Andrew Booth there, who many of you will be familiar with if you have engaged with QES and Claire Glenton from um, Norway, Cochrane Norway's EPOC group. But we also needed to have the methodological expertise. And on the bottom left hand corner, you can see Zing Wee Chan, who was um, crucial to the team in terms of teasing out our concepts for the search and for the screening. So when you think about the Dream uh, QES team, 
um, we needed a skilled information specialist, uh, a core team who could work consistently on the review. So four of us, um, myself, Linda Beastie, Pauline Maskell, and Hannah Delaney up in the top right hand corner really worked around the clock on this. Um, and then we referred to our experts as and when we needed to, and they were very responsive by email or by Zoom or uh, whatever platform. And then because it sat within the Cochrane Epoch group, we needed a really supportive editorial team, which we certainly had. Um, and it was just this whole hands on deck type um, approach to trying to complete the review in the time allowed. So um, again, it's hard to ask in a room or an online platform, but just for those, uh, or just as a reminder of the common stages of a qualitative synthesis, um, and this is how I will structure the rest of the presentation as well. So forming the team, formulating the review question and the protocol, searching for and identifying relevant studies, describing the studies and extracting the data, assessment of methodological limitations of the included studies, which would sort of equate to risk of bias for systematic review, uh, the process of synthesis, assessment of confidence in the review findings. So again, that equates slightly to, to grade, um, and then writing the report. So I'll kind of try and structure um, my presentation around those key stages, looking at what we did, what the guidance was, and as I said, some reflections on, you know, how we felt at the end of it. And I, I'm conscious that I, um, I may speak fast. So if you need me to slow down, please do ask me to do so. Um, okay, so where to start? We looked to the guidance. We had the EPOC guidance protocol and review template. Those who have done QES may be familiar with that. And the qualitative, Cochrane Qualitative Implementation and Methods Group guidance. We also looked at um, a guide to conducting rapid qualitative evidence synthesis for health technology assessment. And of course, the interim guidance that um, Tamara mentioned earlier, and I love the slide that Tamara had um, regarding that guidance. But what we found, I guess, and this is where some of our discussion and reflections were, is that um, sometimes the interim guidance for rapid reviews was quite difficult to apply to a qualitative synthesis, which is quite an iterative process. And we make methodological decisions that may differ slightly from the more traditional systematic review. So asking the question in the context of the rapid QES, again, as Trudy mentioned earlier, we received the question, we didn't develop the question, but we did need to really tease out what we were going to look at what we meant by the different concepts and how that would feed into our search strategy. So we use the SPICE acronym. Um, again, if those may or may not be familiar with it, uh, the equivalent of a PICO, um, where we look at setting, perspective, the phenomenon of interest, comparison, and evaluation. So you can see that the concepts are quite broad and this actually made the search quite difficult. Healthcare setting is very broad, so we were looking at community, uh, primary healthcare settings. So again, quite a, a, an open book in terms of where we were looking. Again, healthcare workers. We did look at um, medical staff, nursing and midwifery staff, allied health professionals, ancillary staff, and laboratory staff. So quite a broad umbrella again. Um, the phenomenon of interest was adherence with infection prevention and control guidelines for respiratory infectious diseases. So again, you're nearly looking at three concepts there, the adherence, um, infection prevention and control guidelines, and then the respiratory infectious diseases, which involved a lot of discussion with the methodological experts about which respiratory infectious diseases would be uh, relevant or um, pertinent in terms of uh, informing COVID-19. And the comparisons across different settings, different diseases and different um, healthcare worker types. And again, it was really to understand the barriers and facilitators to adherence. So we weren't trying to pick out um, why healthcare workers didn't adhere to infection prevention and control guidelines, but rather what in the environment or what in the organisation or what in terms of their knowledge was impacting on their decision to adhere. 
Okay, so as I identified there, you can see the challenge of the concepts, um, very broad and quite complex. We did do a scoping search in advance of that, um, and we actually screened, I can't remember now, but a couple of hundred in advance of actually doing the search in order to inform and get a handle on the topic and on the research question. So the experience, uh, the expertise of Andrew Booth and Mike Small, who is our information specialist based in Galway, um, and the search strategy underwent peer review by two different Cochrane information specialists. So at least we felt fairly confident at the end of this that we had the best search strategy that we could manage in such a short space of time. In terms of reflecting on the search strategy, so yes, we only used one database, we used Medline. And um, was that a compromise or not? Again, in the context of qualitative evidence synthesis, you could, um, you could argue that you're not looking for a, an exhaustive or, or, or a sensitive search, but actually the specificity of the search can be as important as anything. So again, running that the, the scoping search undertaking peer review of the search strategy, we felt that we did pretty well, even though we were limited to only one database. And while we didn't include grey literature, we did have the benefit of the scoping exercise, and we also implemented citation chaining. So again, using that incremental approach, um, whereby the included studies were used to identify further research that could be included as well. Now, we all got involved in this stage, as I said, and with the screening as well, because the four of us that were on the core team that were working around the clock on this, we all wanted to be familiar with the work. We didn't want to kind of, for want of a better word, share out the different stages in order to make it quicker. We all wanted to be involved from the outset so that we could have that kind of engagement immersion and that in-depth understanding of the topic as we went along. And that actually paid off in dividends when we got to the stage of synthesizing. So just move on to the next stage. And um, again, if you look at the guidance, there is um, you know, different guidance in, in terms of who should screen or how many should screen, for, um, sorry. Um, but we actually decided to do double blind screening at both stages, so both at title and abstract and full text. And we call this our security blanket. <laughs> and again, that was because this all happened so quickly and we really wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page, that we had a full understanding of what we meant by infection prevention and control guidelines, what we meant by healthcare workers, that we understood the topic from the very outset. And this also involved a lot of constant communication. So again, we were practically living in each other's home offices for the couple of weeks that we were working on this because we needed to have that you know that kind of coffee cup conversation that you would normally have um, in a place of work so we needed to have that kind of discussion between us as we went along rather than doing a stage and meeting up afterwards the other thing thing to mention as well is that we used a sampling frame for the review. So after we had finished uh, full text screening, we had 36 studies for inclusion. And I guess this is one of the decisions again made in the context of a rapid review is that we decided to apply a sampling frame. And this would be again something that's uh, acknowledged in qualitative evidence synthesis. You're not looking for all of the work. You're looking for the depth. So it's, ra it's rather than breadth, it's depth of, of insight. Um, and we were able to use the sampling frame developed by Heather Ames, Claire Glenton and Simon Lewin to actually pick out, to make sure that we had a really good geographical spread, that we had a good representation of the different types of infectious diseases, but also that we had studies that were rich and would give us the in-depth insights that we needed. And then data extraction. Um, so for me, I am um, a keen uh, in vivo user. I'm not sure if anyone else in the room is. So I would normally do all of my extraction and synthesis in in vivo. Um, some of the team that I work with uh, or worked with would be more used to kind of a more uh, manual way of coding and synthesizing. Um, so we needed to come up with a quick solution as to how we could manage data extraction 
in a way that could be um, worked as, at within a team as well. So we decided to use Google Forms um, and this allowed us to extract the characteristics of included studies. Um, and it's, uh, Pauline was the one that actually set this up, but she was able to download the information in Excel as well. So we were able to populate the characteristics of included studies quite easily from Google Forms. And we also used a theoretical framework to actually kickstart the process of synthesis and analysis. And we've, um, I'll talk about synthesis in a second, but we used a framework by Moore in 2005, um, and it looked at barriers and facilitators to adherence under three key headings, the organizational factors, the environmental factors, and the individual factors. Um, and each within those are a number of kind of subcategories. So we were actually able to populate these within Google Forms um, before we even started the stage of synthesis. So it was all about kind of timeliness and keeping the ball rolling as quickly as we could. So what did we do? We had a data extraction form designed specifically for this synthesis. What we did was pilot this process on three studies. So we had one reviewer extracting the data and then a second person coming in and reviewing for accuracy and completeness. So it was really kind of a good cross check um, or a good demonstration of rigor on, on the, the usefulness of this um, extraction form. And again, as I probably will keep repeating myself, this continuous discussion and moderation um, that we needed to keep going to ensure the consistency of our decisions and the work that we used. Looking to the guidance, again, they said single reviewer extraction was the most commonly reported method in rapid reviews. And the Cochrane's interim rapid review guidance recommends that one re reviewer extracts the data while a second reviewer checks for accuracy and completeness. Excuse me. So we were kind of following the rapid review interim guidance in that instance. So we had our included studies, we had 20, um, we had our data extraction completed. And before we started synthesis, we used, uh, we wanted to conduct our assessment of methodological limitations. So looking at the primary studies and seeing um, or assessing how many methodological limitations they had. For those of you who've done QES, you'll be familiar with CAST, the Critical Skills Appraisal Programme, which is probably the most commonly used critical appraisal tool for QES. And um, we used an adapted version of this that kind of um, linked in quite nicely to the EPOC guidance and integrate CERCWAL. Um, and here's just a screenshot of um, the assessment of methodological limitations uh, table where we identified major, minor, um, or no methodological limitations in each of the primary studies. So in terms of what the guidance says, most of the rapid QES reported in the scoping review by Campbell uh, did conduct a quality assessment. And the Cochrane's interim rapid review guidance uh, suggests that quality assessment is conducted by a single reviewer with verification of all judgments by a second reviewer. So what did we actually do? As I mentioned, we used the adaptation of the CASP tool. Each included study was appraised independently by two core team members with disagreements resolved through discussion. So again, with our security blanket, we were <laughs> we did not feel able to let go of the the this kind of double, uh, double two team process. Um, we could have considered a single reviewer assessment with a process of verification. But again, we really wanted to know these studies and this kind of reading and rereading of the primary studies we felt on reflection benefited us in the long run when reporting our findings. Um, I just say today at the moment, if I do go over time, please let me know. Um, I know I kind of delayed the start, so do keep an eye on me and don't be afraid to um, <laughs> tell me to stop. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned before, we used a framework synthesis approach or best fit framework synthesis, um, which is considered a very pragmatic approach. Uh, it draws on, a, on an existing conceptual framework to use, use to identify the a priori themes. But if there is, you know, and we did acknowledge this from the outset, that sounds like a very deductive 
um, approach. It sounds like you're trying to fit the data into this kind of preconceived framework, but the whole, I suppose, the, an important point to make about best fit framework synthesis is, is that if the data doesn't fit, you can either um, take an, an additional thematic synthesis approach and build additional themes and sub themes, or you can even adapt and change the themes and sub themes that already exist. So it just provides a platform, it provides a structure to begin your um, synthesis, but it's by no means meant to um, exclude any pertinent data or it's not there to risk kind of fitting a square peg in a round hole for want of a better term. So um, just to remind you again of the organizational factors, the environmental factors and the individual factors, we did change one of the sub themes under organizational factors um, to availability of training programs because the original uh, the original label didn't really capture what we found within our included studies. Um, the environmental factors were around the physical environment, the availability of PPE, and the individual factors um, around people's knowledge, around their attitudes and beliefs. And again, an additional sub theme that we included that wasn't in the original framework was looking at the discomfort of PPE. So what you could find from all of this really was that there were a lot of structures in place within an organization that acted as barriers and facilitators. There were problems in the environment that acted as barriers or facilitators. And there were these individual factors around knowledge and attitudes that impacted on adherence as well. And as I said, I'm kind of focusing on the methodology today, but um, you know, there's a, a, quite a bit of information out there on what we actually found in our review. So just to reflect on that actual stage of the rapid QES, so the synthesis stage, um, we use the best fit approach. This is the four of us, again, spent plenty of time staring at each other <laughs> over the computer screen, um, having these uh, kind of ongoing discussions. Um, using the framework allowed us to have kind of an, a balanced, uninterrupted analysis and synthesis but we also had this kind of critical peer review. So for example, um, Linda took the, having used the data extraction form, Linda was able to take all the data around organizational factors. Pauline was able to take all the data around the uh, environmental factors. Myself and Hannah were able to take all the data around the individual factors. So we could actually throw ourselves in. Um, you know, as we talk about qualitative work, you often dive in and, you know, you need to immerse yourself in the data, but then we all came back together, looked at what we had found, looked at the overlap, looked at potential contradictions, and that kind of ongoing discussion was crucial. So we weren't working um, independently, we were constantly negotiating and talking to each other, but at the same time we were able to kind of do that individual thinking work that needed to be done in a, in a, in a short space of time. And I suppose one of the compromises there was we didn't have time to do subgroup analysis. And I know a few, there's been a few mentions of updating the reviews, and that's certainly something that we're going to do in the update of the review. And I'll, I'll mention that again later. So finally, um, or almost finally, the assessment of confidence in the review findings. So as I said, we had 26 key findings that um, sat within those three broader themes. And we conducted grade circle on each of those review findings. So again, without going too far into QES methodology, but looking what in order to assess your confidence in each of the findings, you need to um, assess them under four key headings. So the first one is the assessment of methodological limitations, which, as you know, we had already done in advance of the synthesis um, relevance. So looking at the relevance of the findings, and in order to do this, we needed to kind of go back to the review questions. So if some of our findings were only about, or the studies that contributed to some of our findings were all uh, in the space of TB and we had no SARS and no MERS, or they were all conducted in one specific area in the world, or if there were only one specific healthcare worker group, that would impact on the relevance across the broader research question. The co coherence is how much the studies or how well the studies are saying 
contribute and are saying the same things in the context of the key finding. And then probably the easiest one to assess is the adequacy of the data. So not just how many studies contributed to a particular finding, but the depth of data within those individual studies as well. And um, so we undertook grade CERQUAL. We felt it was really important to do this um, knowing the kind of importance of what we were going to be doing with these findings. And um, again, here is a screenshot of some of our findings studies that contributed to that particular finding and our um, assessment of confidence. Now this is the um, summary table which you would find in the main body of the Cochrane review and actually we were given a small reprieve because again we were working, um, some of us were doing pen and paper, some of us were doing on the computer, uh, we were firing documents across and back in a very short space of time. So Cochrane Epoch agreed that we could submit the full grade circle table after the review was published. So it is up there now. We did it a few weeks later, but they did publish it without that full um, table just for a, a rapidity, of course. Yes. Um, and we had all the information there and they knew that we had it. It just didn't look pretty enough to be published at that stage. And again, this kind of constant discussion. So we each took findings. We each conducted the grade circle across. And then we had almost this kind of um, talk through discussion. So I would take a finding. I would explain how and why I assessed it on each of the components. And then the team would have a discussion around that. So this kind of live um, talking through of our assessments. We had to talk a lot, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so reflecting on assessing our confidence and findings, um, again, the assess the interim guidance um, suggests a single reviewer approach with verification from a second reviewer. And that's really what we did. We independently um, assessed the confidence in the findings, but the final assessment was based on a consensus across the core team. Um, and, and we were familiar with using grade circles, so that kind of, I suppose, helped in the long run. But we did have to have that conversation and make sure that we all were assessing in a similar, in a very similar way or almost identical way. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, around the reporting of uh, the rapid QES. And again, you know, sitting within the Cochrane Epoch group, we had a, an accelerated peer review process. We had four people peer reviewed over the Easter weekend. Um, the copy editing again happened really quickly, a huge input from uh, the Cochrane community and there was a lot of work behind the scenes and people took a lot of that heavy lifting away from us as the core team because we were kind of busy trying to get over the line in terms of the actual review itself and um, so we had people in the background ready to kind of hit the ground running when we had um, the draft of the review ready to go. Uh, the Cochrane Epoch group developed an evidence summary, so kind of a two-page document that people could read quite quickly and easily in terms of the implications of our findings. Um, evidence Synthesis Ireland and Cochrane Ireland developed an infographic, again, a one-page document that would help people read and digest the findings quite quickly and easily. And just talking about the reflections of this, um, we relied on so many people. People. And I suppose just to kind of show you the acknowledgements page, how many people we needed to get this over the line. And also in terms of the evidence or the implications for practice, we had a huge number of healthcare workers read the evidence summary document. And these were healthcare workers from all around the world, read the document and give feedback on its readability and its usability. So that was really important to us that we knew that people would kind of get what we were trying to say and that we were writing it writing it for the target audience rather than for ourselves. And the impact of our findings, so it did uh, inform some of the interim guidance from the WHO. Now I know that those guidelines are changing or they're being updated. Um, they informed the Royal College of Emergency Medicine best practice guidelines. There was a um, Cochrane podcast in multiple languages and those implementation, that implementation document that I mentioned is also published in a number of um, languages. 
published in the Irish Times, which would be the national newspaper here in Ireland, and an evidently Cochrane blog published by Sarah Chapman. Um, and you can see from the altmetric scores as well that it did receive high attention um, once it had been published. And again, as Michael mentioned earlier, it's that balance between speed and rigor. So it sort of feeds in nicely to this slide. Um, wanting to make sure we could get it done quickly, but without compromise um, of the methodological considerations throughout. So in order for the speed, we needed that support and, you know, people who had our backs, for want of a better word, having the topic and methodological experts on the team, having that core team that would work around the clock, as I mentioned, we needed a lot of communication, a lot of humor, support, goodwill, it wasn't a time to be precious or prickly or get offended by anything. We just had to get on with it and get along. And, you know, we really did get along. And um, it was quite a special experience from that perspective. And that kind of, as I said, that idea of discussions in real time. So actually doing the work together, albeit on an online platform and that kind of throwing everything at it. And we all made certain sacrifices at that stage um, to get it done within the time. In terms of rigor, again, the experience of the team, having the support from EPOC, that idea that we stayed too close to the data throughout. So all of us were in state, all of us were involved in every stage rather than divvying out or allocating different stages to different people. And we had that substantial peer review, which gave us some peace of mind and that stage two option that I mentioned. So we submitted the full evidence profiles uh, afterwards. And we also wrote the discussion after it was first published as well. Um, and up in the corner, you can see a paper, a process paper written by Linda Beastie, um, kind of just looking again more at these methodological decisions that we made. And finally, um, this is from Linda, calendar dates may, may denote rapid completion, but they do not attest to the extensive hours and intensive effort required a point of which those who agree to take on such endeavors must be aware. Now ours was particularly quick as you can see, but just nice to remember that it's not just about, you know, again, it, rapid doesn't mean cutting too many corners, rapid means, you know, meeting a, a very strong deadline. So I hope that was helpful. I'm going to stop sharing. And apologies again for the quick exit at the beginning. I don't think I could have concentrated knowing those <laughs> children stuck on the doorstep crying. <laughs> no problem, Catherine. Thank you so much um, for that presentation. It was really um, great to see examples from different types of rapid reviews. Um, I think there are some comments in um, the chat and um, I've written them all down. So I think I'll start with what I have on my list. Um, I've sort of tried to order them. Um, and any of the four of you can respond um, to these questions. So the first question that I actually had, and this was just when Trudy was um, talking about the number of rapid reviews um, that um, the committee had conducted. Um, I was just thinking about whether conducting rapid reviews at such a fast pace, um, at such high volumes is something that is sustainable. Um, and I guess this goes hand in hand with, you know, when is it sort of um, appropriate to do a rapid reviews for an emergency response? And when do you then decide to actually go back to maybe doing more longer type um, reviews that take longer? Um, so maybe that could go to uh, Tamara or Trudy um, as a question. Um, so Tamara, if I can, and then you can contribute if you don't mind, is that right? Um, so I think it's exactly what Michael had presented um, when he mentioned when do you do a rapid review and when you do a living review. So all of this is, is basically emergent evidence. So the evidence has been really uncertain. Um, and once the evidence becomes more robust, um, then essentially it should be turned into, um, and, and, and it matures, it should then be turned into a systematic review. Um, and our, we, we still have a lot of questions um, with regards to management of the, of the pandemic. Um, new molecules are 
as, as we speak, are <laughs> apparently there's new evidence for a new antiviral um, that has just been flushed in the news. Um, so, so it depends also on the on the health setting. Um, so, but as it matures, it then should be transformed into proper systematic reviews. That, that's my two cents. Thanks. Over to you, Tamara. Thanks, Trudy. And also to, to just to thank and acknowledge all this other, my colleagues who have been speaking. It's been so interesting to be part of this. Um, I think what I wanted to add to what Trudy said um, is that the beauty of being part of a global network of people working in evidence synthesis is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, so as much as a, a comprehensive proper systematic review is needed, our work is often to find the group that's already done that systematic review and summarize and present it. So in fact, part of our rapid review methodology is first to find high quality, up-to-date systematic reviews and present them. And I think that that is key to kind of, so as much as we may be cutting corners in that we're not conducting a review with primary studies, we are conducting a rapid review that looks for systematic reviews. And so we've partnered, um, as Trudy mentioned, with the COVID NMA initiative, which is from Cochrane France, and we're able to make use of those systematic reviews, um, which I think is incredibly helpful. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tamara and Trudy. Um, and then I think with um, all of the presentations, you shared examples of different types of shortcuts that you took. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying shortcuts in inverted commas, um, just you know, uh, acknowledging how much work and effort and resources and time it still takes um, to do the rapid process. Um, so how did you actually go about deciding which shortcuts to take when, when um, conducting your rapid reviews? Um, and that, that can be to anyone um, of the four of you. Hi, B. Michael here. Maybe um, I can give a quick input and then I can hand over to Catherine, who I'm sure also has a different perspective when it comes to qualitative evidence synthesis or rapid review of qualitative synthesis. And I think this is where there's a lot of exciting work happening, especially in the I would call it quantitative systematic review or rapid reviews. Um, and I think the answer to that question about which shortcuts to take is first to say which are the ones that has to happen no matter what the cost. Um, and I think there tomorrow's slide um, that you showed earlier around what are the usual steps of a systematic review, um, you need to consider those first. Um, and set in stone the steps that need to take place. Um, so for example, this looking at the certainty of the evidence, looking at the internal validity of the evidence, and of course, having a comprehensive um, and transparent search yield. Um, when it comes to the kind of uh, shortcuts you can take, I think it depends on your timeline and the team and the kind of resources you have. I think at each stage of the review, you can maybe, um, one of the key ones is how many reviewers will screen and do data extraction. Um, if at, at that level you need to do that, um, especially considering the yield. And uh, my preference is to do two reviewers uh, at screening. As Catherine also mentioned, that safety net is so important. Uh, but there's also now a trend to move to screening a portion um, of the titles and abstracts and then having a second person um, check. And I think as long as you're transparent about what you're doing, um, and systematic, then that's really a good tick mark to look at. Um, typically, you know, screening, risk of bias, data extraction is done independently and in duplicate, but in a rapid review, you might want to say, okay, well, we can do one, one person each with a, with a person that can check. Uh, but again, resources is, and time is the main factors there that I think will, will define what shortcuts you can take. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Catherine? 
Hi everyone. Um, I was just going to, I suppose, as Michael said, each review team would make different decisions based on their own background and expertise. And I think because we had quite a bit of experience with the methodology, we didn't really want to, um, but we hadn't done a rapid review before, we still wanted to maintain many of those stages as would be normal. So I think the main decision we made was around the single database search. But we felt that that was justifi justifiable in itself because of that non-exhaustive nature of qualitative synthesis that I mentioned. And the fact that, you know, we knew that or we will be once um, <laughs> we will be updating the review in a, in a less rapid format and that we could broaden our searches then. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Tamara, you wanted to add? Yeah, I think I just wanted to add be that, you know, not just about the shortcuts, but one of one of the lessons over the years of doing reviews is um, is about the PICO. And so anyone here who's involved with starting some research, you have to define your question very clearly. And that and if and if the PICO is not done extremely clearly, it will waste time later. So in terms of not so much a shortcut, but making sure the PICO is very clear, particularly in a decision making situation. So where we are working with a, a committee that has to make a decision whether to recommend something or not, deciding which outcomes are critical for that decision and which are less critical up front um, saves a lot of time down the line. Um, so it's about efficiency. And also, and that's one of the processes I think we've really strengthened in, in trying to kind of get to the point of defining the outcomes very clearly in advance. And we know globally, the, the, the process is often to, to, um, to rate the, the importance of the different outcomes so that if it comes to a kind of a tie break, you can say, well, we pre-specified that mortality was more important than self-reported um, feeling better. And in that way, so I think there's some things that, and that's not something you can shortcut. And it's something that people rush through to get to the search and find the data, but um, it saves you time to get that right. Thought I'd add that. Yeah, thanks Samara for adding that. Um, the next question is um, one that's from the chat um, that Dan asked. Um, and this is a question about, um, when do you consider updating your rapid reviews um, for new to be able to provide new evidence? Maybe Trudy, you could um, respond to this one because I think you mentioned quite a lot about the challenges of having to update um, rapid reviews and continuously doing that. Yeah, sure, no problem. We'll do so. Be. Um, I'm just going to quickly show this the framework that the committee had developed. Can you see my slide? Um, yes. On to update the review. So we were getting messages from the Director General or the committee via the uh, National Department of Health Secretariat and the um, Deputy Director Generals and the Executive Management saying, have you seen the new study? Um, is there a new update coming along? So <laughs> this is continuous because the, the evidence kept on emerging. Um, so what the committee did, and obviously um, the recommendations are informed by the grade approach, is they took the current report, okay, and looked at the current decision status. So let's take critical stories. It's a strong positive recommendation. So any new efficacy data um, would not result in an update because it's already a strong positive recommendation unless it tended strongly towards the null. So it's obviously showing um, a, an opposite um, outcome as to what the current recommendation is. Um, if there's a new harm signal, a strong harm signal, then they would review it. So if there's any um, weak evidence or um, low, very low certainty, and it is a currently a strong positive recommendation, the committee wouldn't consider um, updating it. Um, it's pointless because you've already got um, strong evidence to un, um, support as the foundation for the current recommendation. If you go onto the other side, if it's a conditional negative recommendation, 
So the evidence is not very strong. It could be um, low certainty or very low certainty. And there's a new efficacy signal, which is strongly positive, okay? Um, so it's stronger than what is currently um, informing the decision, um, whether it's efficacy or um, harm, the committee would update it. If it is basically more or less the same um, um, certainty evidence as what is informing the current recommendation, they wouldn't um, update it. So in other words, anything that is going to change the recommendation is, is what informs their decision to update. I hope that does um, help. Obviously, um, if it's equipoise, that's pretty uh, obvious. Um, if new evidence um, emerges that um, um, will cause the recommendation to go into either either direction with a negative or positive, um, the committee would then have a look at that. So it depends on the current strength of the current current strength of the recommendation. Um, for the current decision. Um, thanks. I hope that helps and makes a little bit clear yeah. in the terms of reference document in the on the website. Thanks. Yeah, that helps. Thanks, Trudy. Um, Michael, Tamara, um, Catherine, do you have anything additional to add to that before I go to the next question? Okay, I, everyone's muted. I assume that's a no. Um, so um, the next question was about, I think this one is specific to you, Catherine, um, and it's really around the decision of using the SPICE framework. So how did you actually decide to use that framework, especially because you mentioned that the concepts um, related to your review question were quite complicated as well. Um, is there another framework that you think you could have used to maybe clarify aspects of the review question? Um, yeah. Yeah, I talk about this quite a lot. I tend to use SPICE because it's the one I'm most familiar with. And I think it was uh, a time in which we weren't willing to um, experiment methodologically, I suppose. But, you know, SPIDER and SPICE are very similar. Um, you're just teasing out the types of research really more in SPIDER, but certainly you could have applied SPIDER as well. When you're doing the EPOC template for Cochrane, any way you talk about the types of studies that will be included in your review. So it was kind of a quick decision rather than a well-informed decision, but I think all the elements of SPIDER would have been captured anyway. Thanks, Catherine. I think the next couple of questions are for me as well. I don't want to stay on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think you can take um, the next two questions. Um, I think the one is about the appraisal um, and the con so the methodological limitations and the confidence. Um, yeah. And I think there's also a follow up question around the methodological quality as well. Okay, so how to uh, appraise the qualitative studies. So we used an adapted version of the CASP tool. Um, there are a number of different appraisal tools available. I would argue that they, none of them are completely fit for purpose. Um, there's always going to be some level of interpretation or subjectivity, which is why that kind of ongoing debate and the fact that two of us did the assessments just to be sure. Um, but uh, if you read the Cochrane guidance, uh, they primarily refer to CASP. And again, it was the, the tool that we were most familiar with. So we felt we could hit the ground running in terms of progressing with the review by using that one. And um, I see the second question in that is, is the quality appraisal and confidence in the evidence the same? And if not, why? So with quality appraisal, we're looking at the quality of the primary study. So we're looking at each primary study to see um, the methodological implications or decisions that they made and if we felt that that might impact in our confidence in the finding. So if a finding that we developed came from two studies um, whereby we had major methodological concerns, we would have to lower the quality of our assessment in that finding. So the critical appraisal or the quality appraisal is, is based on the individual studies. The overall assessment of confidence in our findings is, um, is different because we're looking at what we have found, what we have synthesized and de developed. 
And we're asking questions of that to see how confident are we in making that statement. So healthcare workers may be less likely to adhere to infection prevention control guidelines if they find the face masks uncomfortable. I'm just picking that one out of the air. In order to make such a statement, we want to be we want to know how confident we are in that. And again, if the individual studies feeding into that finding are of poor methodological quality, that's going to impact on our confidence. But it's much more than just that. It's also the adequacy of the data that I mentioned. So is there enough data to support this finding? Is the, are the primary studies relevant enough to support this finding? And are they all saying, the studies that feed into this finding, are they all saying the same thing? So it's the assessment of confidence is on the finding as a collective that we have synthesized and developed and identified. But if we're going to share that finding um, and disseminate that finding, we, we need to make a judgment of how confident we are in it. So that's the key distinction between um, a critical appraisal and uh, assessing of confidence. I don't know if you agree <laughs> with that, Fee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks, um, Catherine. Um, so uh, while I, I'll go on to the next question, I'll start with Michael, but I, I see some um, questions, I think follow up questions for Judy and Tamara around the rapid reviews. So maybe you could just have a look at those in the chat. Um, Michael, I just wanted to ask you um, a very sort of practical question. Um, what is one um, mistake that you made during conducting one of the rapid reviews? Um, and how did you fix it? <laughs> um, hmm. so, so, well, yeah, okay. So that's a good question. Um, I, hmm. So I think maybe a mistake that we've made um, is around uh, when, we look, when we did a vaccine review is we were looking at COVID NMA and the existing um, trials around vaccines and AstraZeneca and Sinovac. And um, we, what was it now? We, 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 there were so many interlaced trials and different registration numbers and um, that we easily got confused as methodologists um, because we weren't in the, in the, in the thick of the context and we didn't have the clinical, um, background. And I think it took us a while to realize that we can't figure this out on our own and we need to draw on our content experts. And so the lesson I learned in that is don't dwell for a day on um, how, how all of these trials fit into each other um, and which are multi-center and multinational or just single center and so forth, but uh, speak to another content expert or trialist who's um, within your team. And I think that speaks again to setting up the right team um, having both methods expertise, you can guide process and grade and all of those things, but also leaning on your content experts, your um, clinical pharmacologists or vaccinologists or microbiologists or, who are also part of the team. Um, and so uh, leaning on them and, and playing the team game, the collaborative game, I think is exceptionally important in these rapid turnarounds. Mm, yeah. I think that's a very big and important one. Um, and I think no matter how challenging it is to find the right people, it's I think it's as important as the question. Um, so having a very specific, narrowly defined question is just as important as having the right team um, that can help in terms of the different aspects of addressing that question. Thanks, Michael, for that. Um, over to you, uh, Tamara and Trudy. Um, so the, the, the one follow-up question is around whether there's any value in updating, um, in updating even if um, new evidence is just equal or lower than the current recommendation, especially if it's a living review. Um, and then if there's no uh, specifically set value, do we add that new study in our forest plot and determine if the estimates change in direction and strength? Trudy, do you want me to start us off on this one? 
Um, yeah, sure. You can go ahead tomorrow. Thanks. I think it's basically the setting that we're using the reviews for. Mm. Yeah, it mm -hmm. makes sense. Thanks. Mm. Oh, no, go ahead. It sounds like you have. Go ahead, Trudy. And I'll jump in. Sorry, the reception is getting a bit busy here. So I do apologize for any background noise. Um, so um, the intent of using um, doing the, the rapid reviews in, in our context is actually to inform the clinical guidelines. Um, so based on, and, and we, as Tamara has mentioned, we, we, use a, we collaborate extensively with the COVID NMA team. Um, lots of backwards and forwards um, communication takes place. Um, but the intent is, as I mentioned, the intent is to inform national guidelines, clinical practice, policy, um, procurement decisions. Um, so it's not really just to update, to live and review, I wouldn't say from an academic exercise, but to, to inform practice. Um, so the recommendation is, is essentially what the committee is looking for. And um, that's the reason why we don't essentially just update um, um, the living review every time the evidence is, is forthcoming, or the committee doesn't do that, taking in consideration the limited resources. Um, there's not a huge team that's behind this. It is absolutely done um, on a minuscule scale um, with the support of like self Cochrane SA, Great SA Network, um, and, and, and the likes. Um, so a typical example is the Ivermectin um, living review. Um, the NIMLAC committee had um, definitively taken a stand not to pull that data together because it's so heterogeneous, heterogeneous and um, they weren't confident in it. The data is extremely uncertain. Um, and that informed the recommendation as compared to most of the other living, um, um, the evidence synthesis group actually pulled the data, which created a, a different outcome altogether. So I think it's, it's, it's a setting and the, the reason why we're doing rapid reviews um, is, is to inform national recommendations is, 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 is the most important thing I can think of. Thanks, Mara, if you'd like to add, please feel free yeah. to. No, that's, that's exact. I think Trudy said, so I mean, we, it's about informing a decision. So it becomes less useful if the data doesn't, isn't going to change that decision. And I think from the beginning, we never took a stance that we were doing living reviews. We said we were doing rapid reviews, but there came a point where new data was emerging so rapidly that if we were to update in that living way, which is a different study design, um, then firstly, we just didn't have the resources to do that. And it also wasn't serving because the purpose was to whether, whether the new data changes our decision. Um, and so um, I think it was um, Dan who was just adding in here. So we would have a critical look at any new trial that comes through or, you know, particularly something that gets sent our way and everyone's like, oh, you need to look at this because, you know, you're not recommending remdesivir and here's a new trial. And then you look at it and you look at it and you see that actually it, it it doesn't add terribly much. And, and sometimes you have to add it into a, you know, we would say like a back of the envelope kind of calculation, or you can add it into your forest plot and see if it really is going to make any difference. And then you can make a decision as a committee not to proceed. Um, if it is going to make a difference, then we would proceed um, using the scarce resources that we have. So I think truly I'm just adding a bit to exactly what you're saying. Thanks. Thanks, Tamara and Trudy. Um, Tamara, maybe you can also just speak to um, how to register a systematic review protocol at Cochrane. Um, and then I think from everyone, it would be good to hear um, you can publish rapid reviews um, in addition mm. to Cochrane. Mm, yeah. So Cochrane does publish rapid reviews now. Um, um, so just to take a step back, so when planning your topic, um, the ideal situation is to register your systematic review, the same way that people register clinical trials to make sure that something's in the public domain, the contents in the public domain. The main reason that within Cochrane and now with another registry called Prospero at York University, why you register is to avoid duplication. Um, 
with Cochrane reviews, so when I, when I got involved 10 and 15 years ago, um, it was there was always this ethos of avoiding duplication. You don't do a review if it's already been done. Um, and so registering your title is critical because you can say, oh, I'm really interested in this topic for COVID. And then you can go and see, and you can see, well, actually there's already a title registered or there's a protocol underway, or there's a review happening. And part of the first step of always doing a review is checking what's out there already. And are you truly addressing a gap? So it's critical to register. With Cochrane, there's a specific process and they are also kind of limiting the kinds of and the kinds and topics of reviews to, to ensure that they address certain um, health priorities. Um, but you can register your rapid, your rapid reviews on Prospero. You cannot register scoping reviews on Prospero at the moment. Um, and so that's, it is a critical first step. And, in, and increasingly, if you want to publish a review, you must have a, regist uh, a registered title, um, it must be registered somewhere. You did ask me something else, B, but now it's escaped me. So I'll stop there. Yeah, uh, the, the second part of the question was just to ask where else outside of yeah. Cochrane um, yeah. we can publish rapid reviews. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. So there are lots of, there are increasing numbers of journals so you could publish in a content specific journal. That was quite difficult a while back when people were like, oh, reviews, that's not real research. Well, anyone here who's been involved in a review will know that it will, um, it will give you a few gray hairs. So it's, it's definitely real research and that's increasingly recognized. There are journals, there's a journal called Systematic Reviews where you can publish the BMJ Open and PLOS One and PLOS Medicine. And in fact, um, reviews, particularly reviews that have informed WHO other guidelines can be, can be published in the Lancet, NEJM, all of the journals be, um, and, and I, I assume that rapid reviews, it would be the same. The issue is duplication and that there's so many reviews happening. And I, I don't know, that's a, that's a whole topic in itself is waste in research and the number of systematic reviews being conducted that are not really needed. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tamara. Um, and then I think as a final question, just because I don't see any other comments or questions in the chat, um, is what is the one thing that you really enjoy <laughs> enjoyed about doing the rapid reviews? You know, I think we've spoken about the the experience and some of the challenges, but just to to ask you to kind of leave a, a positive word around um, sort of what aspects about doing the reviews you've individually all enjoyed? I'm on, so I'm gonna just start. Well, obviously it was working with Trudy and Michael. <laughs> um, those are the highlights, but I think, no, truly, I mean, Trudy is a, is a, um, a juggernaut. She is incredible and has, achieved so much and helped us and supported and steered us to achieve so much through the Department of Health, through collaborations. Um, so working with the colleagues that are really intent on doing their best for decision making for health for South Africa, despite very, very challenging situations as truly outlined with ivermectin and vaccines and other things. Um, but also the work is so satisfying, you know, to know that the, the questions that are being posed can further inform health decisions at policy level, but also in practice level is fantastic. So yeah, thanks to, to NDOH for including us. <laughs> Over to you. Anyone can go next. Maura and, and others, I don't know about you, but I know if you do a rapid review, you really get to know people. And Catherine, you had that image around your four colleagues that were with you, and you were saying you just get to know them because you really spend a lot of time together um, and you, you get stressed and you drink lots of coffee. Um, and that's also a part that I really enjoyed is getting to know your colleagues um, and getting to collaborate with people. And that's so much fun. It's fun getting to know people. It's fun to share ideas and uh, bounce, bounce the latest kind of um, methods off each other um, and get a better perspective, whether it be clinical or methodological. So 
really great to see that I, and I enjoy that kind of collegial work together. Um, so if I may, so I think I can reiterate what Michael and Tamara said. It's basically working with and learning from experts such as um, the great essay methodologists. Um, and actually um, their patience was much appreciated because the demands are actually very high. <laughs> Um, and I think also from the amount of work that was being done to actually finally get any positive recommendation from the extensive evidence review and to help the South African population, I think that was like you would actually jump up and down, like finally something works, um, was actually quite a positive outcome. Thanks. Over. Finally, from me again, um, what Michael, Trude and Tamara have said, um, the amount of time that we spent um, together and getting to know each other. And even after it was over, we used to have uh, Zoom meetings for a little while afterwards because we were kind of having withdrawal symptoms. Um, and we felt we couldn't communicate with our friends and family in the same way <laughs> as because we had kind of <laughs> developed some sort of yeah so it's very much that and um i've just put a link to a journal uh, an editorial that we wrote around that idea of working qualitatively um during the pandemic um and again i think on a personal note well i suppose for the for the wider purpose to feel that we were doing something um and contributing to something and working with international experts in the area but then again on a personal level it was um yeah, it was a frightening time, you know, back in March 2020, and it just, it was almost just being able to throw yourself into something without having to think too much about everything else that was going on. So it, it, it yeah, it served a specific purpose for me at that time as well. Thank you, um, Trudy, Tamara, Michael, and Catherine. Um, I think it was a really um, informative, interesting um, uh, uh, session, just to hear the different examples and your experiences. Um, we will be uh, distributing um, the recording link um, via your email, um, the email that you registered with. So please look out for that. Um, and we'll see you at Bye. Thank you, B, and thank you all. Thanks, B. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.